In 1997, we had One Piece, following a boy named Monkey D. Luffy and his quest to become the Pirate King. In 1999, we had Naruto, following a boy, you guessed it, named Naruto Uzumaki and his journey to become Hokage. And then, in 2001, we had Bleach, following a boy named Ichigo Kurosaki. My name is... Ichigo Kurosaki. Now just quickly, why did I bring One Piece and Naruto into this discussion? What did they have to do with this? Well, seeing as Bleach was a part of this generation and this video is aimed at those whom claim Ichigo has no development in comparison to his counterparts, I feel it's great to open my video with these comparisons because Ichigo competed against these two for 10 plus years in Shonen Jump magazine. I find the overabundance of complaints that Ichigo is a badly written character is very unjust and most claims for this come from a handful of things. Number one, being the fact that he doesn't have a cliche goal like Naruto, Luffy and Goku does, purely for the sake of having one like a robot, which is this weird thing that people think Ichigo is a bad character for just because he isn't the same as them. His character is not a collection of one dimensional tropes like eating mass amounts of food or trouble making for attention thanks to the shonen standard by Dragon Ball Z, anything more complex is above the reading comprehension. For example, a video explaining the plot of Bleach was commented with if you have to explain it, then it's shit writing. This argument can be used for Neangelis' Evangelion. People to this day still discuss its story and psychology, but I guess that means it's badly written too. Definitely not the case. But just like Neangelis' Evangelion, people to this day are still discovering the subtleties and hidden meanings behind not only Ichigo, but Bleach itself. Not everything should be handheld for its viewers. So. Let's discuss Ichigo's character. Ichigo is emotionally charged, hard-nosed and has an annoyed expression at times. He has an everlasting will to protect, he's stubborn and never ever lets up while training. But he was able to overcome several of his flaws, his ego, unwillingness to accept from friends and inner demons regarding his battle lust and fears. He has quirks such as being gullible and short-fused, often being the straight man or easy to fool. In comparison to Luffy and Naruto, he is the closest to how people actually are in terms of personality and intelligence in the real world. I think the fact that he is so cut and dry shows he is the most realistic out of that lot and written quite well, contrary to popular belief. But I've also imagined not everyone is fond of this. People read shonen like these wacky personalities and tropes because truth be told, they want to escape the everyday reality that they live in. His characteristics are very clear for a 15 year old with barely any training or experience with the world he's been thrown into in the very first chapter. Imagine getting a sudden power at the age of 15 and expecting not to get a massive ego boost. You're naturally going to get a cocky and arrogant persona as Ichigo shows throughout the course of basically the entire series. So let's start where it all began. Ichigo from chapter two, episode two showed no care for responsibility of the power that Rukia had bestowed upon him. Instead, he had the selfish mindset of he will protect who he wants to and if it's convenient for him. Though even with this mindset, his own pride and honor don't allow him to follow this through as he feels he has a debt to pay to Rukia. To which leads against the great idea for the audience as we go through this back and forth monster of the day hunt and seeing Ichigo become more adaptive to the role. Which leads on to our first major plot point of the substitute Shinigami arc, Grand Fisher. This was a huge realization to Ichigo as it stuck very close to home. This fight caused the very essence of what Bleach is, what Ichigo's goal is and the first important decision he had to make. So let's break this one down. His motivation and honor. As we spoke earlier, this is where Ichigo was completely selfish. He was fighting for himself and his own moral duty. This was the bridge he himself needed to cross and he had always blamed himself for his mother's death. This was that hollow. This was his chance for closure and redemption, to fight for himself, the sisters and the family he had felt caused so much pain to. This was that fact his honor. This leads into his core motivation for the remainder of the series. After his fight with Grand Fisher, he confronts his father about not being blamed for letting his mother die, asking questions as to why no one blames him. What was this missing puzzle he quite wasn't figuring out? This would continue to pique his interest as Ishin tells Ichigo not to waste Masaki's death in vain and lead the life he wants to, and to be happy, otherwise Ishin wouldn't be able to face her. And it was those words that motivated Ichigo that if he didn't get closure, he wouldn't be able to face his mother. 
This is the first character developing moment for Ichigo in just a few chapters. It's no longer Ichigo destroying Hollows for the sake of repaying a debt. It's now asking Rukia to allow him to become a Soul Reaper just a little bit longer. This leads into the bigger question for him. As he fights with Uryu and the Hollows, he re-establishes this decision for explaining to Uryu why he fights Hollows. His mother was killed by one, and seeing the stress and hurt that it caused him and his family, he wishes to never allow anyone to go through that pain that he himself went through. So okay, now we have the justification for his actions. Actions. What does Ichigo really want in the long term? It's simple, answers. Which you will later find the answers to all of his questions during the fight with your watch. The answers about his mother and her death. The very moment Ichigo had been told about that, he regresses a little during his conflict as Ichigo refuses to utter the word kill. This could be due to the shock of manipulation that you watch had been given Ichigo about his mother. He does hold all the questions after all and Ichigo wants to know everything. This is evident to the plot, as Ichigo states that this whole story was so that he could reach this very moment while reminiscing. He tried to go all out against Graham Fisher, but failed. Finding out that Yuwatch was the real cause behind his mother's death, by defeating him, he avenged her. Things were personal with Yuwatch, the final villain of the story, and it connects to what was shown in the very first arc. His fight with Ikaku during the beginning of the Soul Society arc, though not what people would class as a milestone fight so to say, that fight is the perfect example for Ichigo to understand what it actually means to fight. While Ichigo is used to the concepts of fighting thugs and mindless hollows, he is now fighting someone with a code of honor and fighting him to the death. His childish ideas of what a quote unquote fight really is, is the first thing that changes in the Soul Society. At this point, he asks asks the enemy to give up merely because of a power difference alone. He's not actually fighting to defeat the enemy, the enemies are just kind of obstacles to him to get to his goal. In fact, he was kind of having fun with Ikaku. Later, he quickly realizes and adapts to this situation he is in as his mindset changes in his second confrontation with Renji Abare, to which he finally uses the word quote unquote defeat to which the anime did a fantastic job in showing the glow in his eyes while saying this. As this shows again later calling back to Hollow Ichigo's iconic speech about instinct. When it came to fighting Byakuya, he is still fighting to beat the resolve of the enemy, which I personally like as it gave more depth between Byakuya later on. But Ichigo removes his sword from his neck and then later breaks down the mask too. His intention was to break Byakuya's resolve and not to kill him. This was narrated by Byakuya 2 to back it up. This tone of course changes later on in the Arankar arc, where Okiura and Yami are the first point in the story where Ichigo fails to protect his friends. It affects him because it is due to his hollow that he fails. He questions whether he is able or unable to withhold it and at this point he doesn't even want to turn into a Shinigami because he is afraid that the hollow will take over. Naturally, this is a break in Ichigo's mentality, confidence, and his sign of weakness and frustration, especially when he shows this when he angrily punches his bed. But thankfully, Rukia acts as a mentor as such, snaps him out of this feeling, and rebuilds his resolve. He resolves to beat some hollows, and then after contacts the Visards in search of help. Hollow Ichigo, <coughs> my favorite character in the series, is the first person in the story who actively questions Ichigo's fighting style and the effectiveness of his personality in battle. He says this out loud that Ichigo does not want to fight, and to him, fighting is a necessity to protect others, which in a way is a limiter to how Ichigo really is. This is solidified through the elaboration of Ichigo's instinct, which manifests as an embodiment of Kenpachi Zaraki and the guy from the Bount, we don't talk about the Bount arc dude, okay? Leading back to their previous fight, which gave Ichigo the taste of enjoyment through battle. This is the climax of Ichigo's change as a fighter. He gets a genuine taste for battle and starts fighting more maliciously, like he's fighting for himself and not for others using instinct. This makes him arrogant of course and it is shown in Heiko Mundo but his enemies quickly beat it into him that you need to have actual power to act strong and hold back during a battle. I agree with Ichigo's mindset and logic but he doesn't have the power at this time to implement that said mindset. This leads into Grimjow. He allows Ichigo to implement that fighting instinct through their battles almost as if Grimjow is his hollow counterpart or to most people 
the first and only proper rival in the series. This affects Ichigo, in a good way of course, but he's not quite himself here yet. This is not really him, just the effects of all the hollow training and inner soul searching that he's been going through. He's trying to find himself among all this fighting and he identifies the things of other people say about him. He picks up the aggression that Grim Jow talks about, but in the end, it just helps him channel down his aggression and calms down after the battle. This is most likely due to him realizing how much of the battle that he himself was enjoying. A nice callback to what Kampachi was talking about when he questions that he and Ichigo were similar in the fact that fighting is for their enjoyment of battle. This quickly brings him back to his more humanistic side when Orihime makes him realize he is hurting himself too much by his own naivety and recklessness. This is the first time in Hueco Mundo where Ichigo starts acting like his old self. After the battle, on the base of his old self, he starts to act through thought rather than emotion. This is another step into Ichigo's character development. He understands the enemy and accepts the enemy but he doesn't befriend them or fall out of the context of the enemy for being said enemy. What I mean by this is strictly, he acknowledges Grimjow that he isn't a true enemy even though he's on the other fighting side. This is also a reference when Ichigo shows disgust towards the way Yami is speaking about Grimjow and Okiora's defeat. This is the first really mature scene of Ichigo in the series. Compared to that wimpy kid who didn't want to take responsibility of protecting everyone because it was too much of a hassle or wasn't his problem to deal with. I could stop the video here, I've just proved just by progressing through the story that Ichigo has development and has growth and mentality change since chapter 2. What comes to mind immediately after the fight with Grimjow is the climax of his hollow power plotline so to say. His fears come true. He loses control entirely and awakens to the notion that he killed and mutilated an enemy and hurt one of his friends. This makes him lose it so much that he does everything to try and save the last bit of his dignity. He even quoted saying that he will let Okiura cut off his limbs to make their fight even. But before he could do so, Okiura dies. This is also a nice awakening to the fact that his enemies he defeat die. A really nice throwback to his fight with Byakuya right after Hollow Ichigo takes over. The two fights are parallel to each other with different outcomes. With Byakuya he could play the hero that changes the end of Ark's boss's mentality but in this case of Okiura, Ryan repeated of this same outcome and went ways of which Ichigo didn't plan. Okura was a nihilistic being that was more curious about how the world worked. Not so much Aizen's ambitions and thus we see it literally moments before he dies right in front of them. The difference between Okura and Byakuya is in most cases Byakuya can be seen as a villain but Okura died an empty death. A death that Ichigo didn't plan. I would imagine this makes Ichigo a mix of emotions, frustrated, annoyed and rather grey, which can also be seen straight away when he saves Rukia from Yami. He doesn't care anymore. Rukia makes note of this when he returns and uses the ideology of the eyes of the victor. But he doesn't lose himself over it, he just kind of changes him. This is Ichigo narrating Yami's absence of sympathy to an Espada dying, and Orihime having empathy for Okiura. It shows the difference between hollows to human on an emotional scale, as Ichigo questions the difference between Yami losing what he would consider a comrade, and Orihime Inoue feeling after losing an enemy. This was that very difference. This is sketchy, but I feel it's worth mentioning as it is important to Ichigo's personality here. Ichigo, for the first time in the series, uses the word korose, which means to kill, instead of tose, which means to defeat, when talking about his enemy. Now I may add, in the Viz translation, it does say to take down Aizen, but that would imply to kill, remove, or defeat, which if it meant as to kill, then that has a lot of meaning. This is important because it highlights a big milestone he has reached in his character throughout the series. And the assumption would be correct as he goes for a clean strike towards Aizen's head which would show his intent to kill. The great thing here is that after Ichigo fails, Aizen straight up tells Ichigo that he's out here on a sense of responsibility. And if we call back to chapter 2, this is something Ichigo wouldn't do in his earlier stages. This is the first point in the story where Ichigo shows that he is growing out of his own childish mentality. 
Directly after this happens, Aizen starts talking about hatred and reason and why frankly it makes no sense for Ichigo to be so inspired to defeat him. The Gotei 13 acknowledge Ichigo by this point. Ichigo is fighting for the Soul Society as much as for Karakura Town and he stated to be captain material even by Toshiro Hitsugaya when he viewed Ichigo's morality and responsibility that he had set for himself. After Aizen reveals that Ichigo's his whole life is a lie, everything was planned out from the beginning and stopped at that big cliffhanger of quote unquote you're a human and a dot dot dot. Ishin shows up and then throws even more Ichigo off with a what the fuck is going on moment but this is what happens next is one of Ichigo's more maturist acts which is really appreciative in my eyes because this allowed us to see that Ichigo was progressing more in the now rather than in the past and on top of that he took the initiative and told Ishin to tell him later as of now was not the time. Whereas other shonen protagonists would have taken 50 years with some talk no jutsu. This gives Ichigo some new quantities, like being able to read the hearts of his enemies. This power of comprehension is not new as he's always been like this, but this is the first point in the series where he's been able to use it consciously and maturely. He proves this by noting that Aizen will do something to Gein, which ironically, Gein tosses it off as more of childish talk, then activates his Bankai in retort. And this is solidified with Ichigo's look of sadness and understanding as he sees a fallen Gin Ichimaru. It's as if he was upset at the fact that he knew that this was going to happen to him. In fact, he even warned Gin of this. I truly believe that this is a magnificent piece of art, conveying emotion through nothing more than a glance at another individual. After this scene in the battle between Ichigo and Aizen, we all know how this ended. Ichigo has a feeling of pensive sadness and naturally so. This is because he decided to sacrifice all of his powers to save everyone. Ichigo's entire character revolved around getting the power to protect who he wanted to protect. But now, in a way, he got what he wanted, right? He finally got that normal life he yearned for back in the beginning of Bleach. Well, not necessarily true. This is where the Fallbring arc comes in. This arc's purpose is not really here to develop him, but here to reflect and establish the new character, which he gained through maturing and basically through the entire manga up until this point. That is why Kubo is quoted saying that the actual purpose of this arc is for it to be a reboot arc and to bring Ichigo back to his roots. What we do see is Ichigo be more witty, self-aware, and how he basically was all of season one. For example, Against Ginjo, he was a smartass, whereas with Jackie, he had the ability to plan ahead in battle and wasn't as impulsive as he was against, say, Grimjow in their fight. Totally stealing that from Aizen. Possibly. Maybe. Remember when he read the quote-unquote heart of the enemy being Gin Ichimaru? This was once again shown throughout his training with Ginjo. By doing so, he read the emptiness and the intentions of Ginjo, then compared them to what he had felt with Tsukishima, letting the audience know that there was going to be a turn in Ginjo's character through the eyes of Ichigo. It shows a new level of perceptiveness and truly develops Ichigo not only as a fighter, but as a human being. We briefly spoke about Ichigo's intent to quote unquote kill when it came to Aizen and recalling how he once saw enemies as nothing more than obstacles that he could defeat with purely logic or swiftly through uh, a bout of fisticuffs. But when it came to Tsukushima, it was very blunt that Ichigo had developed and grasped how serious his enemies can truly be. Hence, what you are currently seeing on screen. It's not development right here, but it was back in the Aizen War that it is re-established of his new fond character and what Ichigo had become. Unfortunately, Ichigo's human emotions could have easily have taken the opposing path like Tozen or Noritora when his family went against him and Tsukushima changed everybody's mind. He was mentally ruined. And confused. This entire scene is widely and quite popular because Ichigo and Bleach copped quite a lot of criticism for the scene where Ichigo showed his most emotion, like a human. A mere scene of Ichigo breaking down, like any normal person would, was somehow bad. Doesn't that contradict the whole point of him apparently not having development? He was on the ground literally crying because he had no power to change things. This power of emotion is also shown when Okio was very slowly taking the path of human and had much interest on how Orihime and Ichigo acted. It was like handing a monkey a cigarette lighter. This world was completely new to Okiora. 
It is worth mentioning in the Nestle Tonight Bleach Data Book 3, when Renji asks the 4th Division members to take away Ichigo after he collapsed from his power loss, he says, Take care of that man, he is the hero to the Soul Society. And the narrator says, And the name of a hero is spread fast among the Shinigami. Ichigo is known as a legend, and this is also shown in the Thousand Year Blood War when he saves the two Shinigami at the very beginning. Ichigo to the Soul Society previously was an enemy, he became a hero. As Toshiro stated before, he's acknowledged as a valuable member of the Soul Society, a respected individual and a hero to many. The Soul Society even went against their own laws, pride as a collective and made a reishi sword, which is used to transfer parts of their own power to Ichigo. I also like to note that when Ginjo told Ichigo about the Soul Society's manipulation, Ichigo was always very wary of this fact anyway. The meaning behind the badge and the sounds emitting from it, he was fully aware. He made the decision and chose to ignore it to continue on. That decision was to fight for them, regardless. He had faith in them. So yeah, this is the Fullbring arc. This is the staple of Ichigo's development and progressions. How this 15 year old kid, who only wanted to save those who he felt like saving, turns into the hero of the Soul Society and didn't back down, even when he learned of the manipulative things that the Soul Society was doing. I think that this is also important that this is where he willingly kills a human. Not because he wants, not because he's anger driven, but because he has to do it to save Ginjo and himself. And this concludes the development side of Ichigo during the Fullbring arc. But now it's time to go a little bit deeper into Kubo's writing. Ichigo loses his powers and gets them back was a great idea. It showed growth. At the beginning of the series, Ichigo wished that he couldn't see spirits. In fact, he found it quite to be the annoyance, as he wanted a normal life. He didn't really have a choice in the matter of acquiring Shinigami powers either. He was just kind of stuck with them until Ruki got hers back. He went from someone who didn't really want this power and fights for total strangers to someone who wanted to save as many people as possible with it. But he was kind of hinted for that anyway when he would bring flowers to that ghost girl and protected that piece around her. I mean, this is the very first scene of Ichigo that is ever shown, but it helped cement that characteristic of Ichigo from the very start. At first, he was reluctant to fill in for Rukia, but gradually comes to realize that this is the perfect opportunity to fulfill his newfound wish, the wish to protect. Remember when I spoke about his encounter with Uryu? Well, it was here that it was solidified. Uryu was someone that he resonated with. Tenza Zangetsu, he was crying because he knew that losing his powers would hurt him. Again, Ichigo never had Nasuchi at this point, and Tenza Zangetsu was manifested purely from Ichigo's spirit alone. So if anyone was going to know Ichigo's feelings, it would be the thing that is a part of his soul. He feels what Ichigo feels. His mental world changes due to Ichigo's mental state. It's his consciousness that is telling Ichigo what he's holding back. This is a really nice recollection to Ichigo's needs and desires, yet Ichigo knows through Zangetsu what sacrifice he would be losing and what this would entail, thus a hard conflict that Ichigo made, hence why Kubo called these chapters the Decide Arc. He was a mess during the time he had no power, his grades even dropped, he was even depressed when he had a job and throughout the anime he seemed all round disinterested in anything. If you guys remember, Ichigo was one of the smartest in his school, with top marks, but as he shrugs this off towards Keigo, deep down he knew what he wanted from his future, he knew what he had lost and wasn't contempt about it either. It was mainly his three friends, Uryu, Chad and Orihime, which knew straight away this wall that he had built up, thus even hurting his friends, who were watching him stroll around like a stray dog, with a fake face of happiness. Tenza Zangetsu said that he didn't want to teach Ichigo the final Getsuga Tensho because he wanted to protect him. He cried because he knew Ichigo would suffer from no longer having power, which is what precisely was shown in the Fullbring arc. Ichigo's friends are also a representation of how Zangetsu saw himself if he ever saw Ichigo suffering like that. The one thing that does not change is my powerlessness. I can see ghosts, I can touch them, and I can speak to them. That's all. They just disappear like this sometimes. I never know what happens to them, but sometimes they leave behind only small spots of blood that only I can see, and the faint smell of fear. No matter how strong I get, I can't protect them. The realization cuts my heart like cold steel. I really wish that this was in the anime. 
Had it been hammered onto us as viewers from the very start of the anime, it would have given us more reasoning and an actual look into what Ichigo's motives are. Like I said at the start of the video, we knew what Naruto and Luffy's goals were straight away. But Ichigo's is? It wasn't a handheld experience, something I also said at the very start of the video. He puts on a fake smile in front of his loved ones, and they notice this, and it worries them. It's fascinating to me how the Fullbring arc replays homage from this very early Bleach, and shows that Ichigo is still human, and even though through the turmoil, he was never able to conceal his obvious anguish, and really plays on the undertone of chapter 18, doesn't smile much anymore. There's also this finding whole balance in his powers and mind that was building up throughout the story, the struggle between resonating his hollow and Quincy side. This is what Ichigo meant when he told White and Mini Yuha that he wouldn't ask for their help anymore and he will fight on his own. This is what Kubo meant in his chapter and poetry called The Blade Is Me. He is one with his spirit, a resonation. He is you and you are me. Bleach focuses more on a psychological and emotional side of things instead of pure power alone. Everything has meaning. Even calling out the name of your attack has a reasoning behind it. People will usually criticize Bleach and specifically Ichigo because of how many transformations and powers he has, calling it the infamous quote unquote ass pull. But these are all consistent storytelling. And I'd comfortably say that 95% of you don't even know much about this topic at all, but we're really going to need to talk about Shinto beliefs. Shinto beliefs hold the concept called the Mitama. Mitama refers to a spirit slash soul of a dead person. Taking that concept even one step further, Ichirei Shikon is the belief that one spirit can house four souls. Ichigo's is human, Shinigami, hollow, Quincy powers slash souls inside of him, competing for supremacy. These four souls are the Negumitama, the harmonious soul, or human so to say. The soul's natural state, the way of being behaves when things are calm and relaxed. The Aramitama, the harsh soul, being hollow, the counterpart to the Negi, and is driven by pure savageness and violent instinct. People tap into it whenever they are faced with adversity or dire threat. The Seikimitama, the happy soul, or Shinigami, loosely defined as prosperity and good luck. It's also considered one of the Negimitama's secondary functions and the Kushimitama, the wondrous soul, or the Quincy soul, the counterpart to the Sekimitama, and its prosperity itself. It causes various transformation and cures wounds and illness. Kubo designed the plus, hollow, Shinigami souls around these concepts of the Negimitama, the Arimitama, and the Saikimitama, or the Sekimitama. This is the most apparent with Ichigo, who has been all of the mentioned spirits at one point or another. Hollow Ichigo has even directly stated that he is Ichigo's pure instinct. Each of the souls has its own personality and function, and they all exist harmoniously. For example, the harsh soul is rough and violent, and the harmonious soul is considered to be the complete opposite to the harsh soul in the same way that humans are the opposite of hollows. The wondrous soul is said to be able to cause transformations and cure illness, both of which that Quince is excelling. The happy soul must represent the Shinigami aspect of Ichigo's spirit. It is the very storyline that follows Ichigo's journey. He struggles to understand the powers within him and then finally finds the balance within his soul. At first, his reaction is always fluctuating, like Okiura stated in his first appearance, and even as early as when Ichigo was fighting at Menos, when Uriya was stating his energy is like a tap on full throttle, but later on it was stabilized. It shows that Kubo isn't making this stuff up as he goes along, and that there is a point to it. Ichigo's development is like a roller coaster, but at this point, part of his journey and development was to find balance in himself mentally and psychologically, which is represented by his power. The more you try and force your Zanpakuto to cooperate with you, the more it will resist. Strength in Bleach is achieved by looking into one's own soul and in asking questions of yourself and of your Zanpakuto, which is an extension of yourself and coming to the realization and understanding of it. Even highest seated officers such as Ikaku and Toshiro have demonstrated meditation with their swords. The mentality of the characters affect the spiritual power, even in the midst of battle, of which Toshiro is used as an example in his fighting with Haribel. An example of Ichigo going through this is when he was underperforming in his third fight against Grimjow. This was because of his worry for Orihime, and this to me was beautiful. 
Let me break this one down. Ichigo transformed into the mask and Orihime called his name and he turned around. You can clearly see that the fact that he scared her pains him so much due to the PTSD from her brother. Worst thing is, he apologizes to her. He is supposed to be the protector, yet he's saying sorry. He values her opinion and feelings for him so much that he feels the need to apologize and try to reassure her. You can even feel the difference in tone compared to his usual way of speech. I think Kubo adding his doodle illustrations really give a wonderful sense of context to each chapter, when needed the most of course in this case of this particular scene, showcasing a hollow representing Ichigo being restrained and held back trying to push forward like a tug of war, much like that guy from the Hell movie being dragged into the gates. Even though Orihime doesn't resent Ichigo for looking this way, it worries her in comparison to the fear and disgust that Ichigo believes Orihime is thinking or feeling, and this atmosphere can be cut with a knife, it's that tense. But Nell knows Ichigo and doesn't suffer from the wall that Orihime has hit, and manages to snap her out of it, and Orihime gives Ichigo the reassurance he deep down needed. Thus allowing Ichigo to break through those trains of restrainment that Kubo later illustrated. Another example is the moment he gained the resolve during his Renji fight, though I still hate that they never shown him grab Renji's sword in the anime because that was such a badass moment. A criticism of Bleach is that it relies too much on the formula of getting beaten, then training, getting stronger and then defeating the previously invincible enemy through power-ups. Then again, that sounds like Dragon Ball, or the quote-unquote ass pull that's a favourite of mine. However, a lot of these other type of power-ups come through greater understanding of themselves. A Zanpakuto is a reflection of their soul, so their own power is tied to their own spiritual awareness. Shinigami certainly train themselves in various forms of combat, mostly weapons training and Kido, but they're all considered very basic training for Shinigami. What really separates the weaker Shinigami from the captains and vice captains is their ability to perform Shikai and then eventually Bankai. This is achieved through introspection, calmness and quietening of the mind. It cannot be achieved through trying to force their Zanpakuto and themselves to the next level. Level. In Bleach, strength comes through inner communication and a greater understanding of themselves and their Zanpakuto. Ability is a big factor in Bleach. Sword releases are generalized as Bankai as 10 times stronger than Shikai, but the releases, they are unique techniques that allow the fighter to better use their strengths and abilities. The power comes from being more in sync with their weapon spirit. Ichigo shows he has tremendous power from episode 1. We did find out he was royal heritage and having forest spirits to explain this, but he lacks the experience and later, confidence. A running theme is that Ichigo's fear holds him back. Fear is a big theme in Bleach. Each quote unquote power up is Ichigo either getting better at using the power he already has or growing as a person. Learning proper swordplay versus relying on instinct or learning how to use a skill effectively versus using it badly and handicapping himself. Balancing the concept of reason and instinct. Getting better at using this power requires gaining a greater mental mind. At being the young age he was, he was thrown into these forces that Ichigo had to grow up faster. The name of chapter 97 is literally, quote unquote, talk about your fear. This has been the very core theme of Ichigo's many layers that we delve into and we kick-started it brilliantly with Kisuke's training. He knew that Ichigo would die and fail if he couldn't quickly overcome that barrier of fear. Imagine getting stabbed or cut. It's pretty scary, right? Ichigo needed to get past that mindset. You can't protect if you hesitate or hold back on the off chance you may hurt yourself or somebody else. That's why I think holding Renji's sword was important and why Kubo made it such a huge panel. It was indicating Ichigo wasn't scared of shedding a little blood. In his inner world, during the fight with Kampachi, he was taught that in battle you need to treat your Zanpakuto as a sentient being. Hollow Ichigo made him know that he was being selfish, thinking that just by what you can see on the surface was was all that mattered, but not understanding that the being that was a part of him was the consensus of turning your back on yourself, and this is what Urahara meant by only being able to teach Ichigo, quote unquote, proper state of mind. The theme throughout the Aronkarag is learning how to control his inner hollow. 
Obvious, I know, but learning to embrace was another step into accepting one side of himself. He already learned trust and companionship for the first time during his fight with Kampachi and his battle for learning Bankai, but now he needed to accept his very own instinct to get out of the routine of being too over-reliant on the Zanpakuto and to trust his own Shinigami power. The quote-unquote Kampachi within Ichigo's subconscious is encouraging Ichigo to embrace his desire for battle. He wants to protect because that's his reason for being able to battle. Ichigo's instinct is fighting. The Soul Society had the concept of reason, and as the Aranka art goes on, has Ichigo having to deal with the concept of instinct. Even though I don't see Dodoni as a likeable character, his fight with Ichigo definitely made a mark on Ichigo's mentality and what was to come into the fight. Dodoni showed Ichigo his ignorance, but also showed him the respect towards treating him like a true enemy by going all out and wasting his stamina on what you would call a lesser Espada, not to mention healing the enemy as well. But he gave Ichigo the advice to leave his sunshine and rainbows behind because it is kill or be killed. There's no logic, or in fact, reason, like the Soul Society. Grimgel taunts him, claiming that he loves to fight and that his battle instincts brought him there, and that's the reason why he came to fight him, not to rescue Orihime. Neliel, on the other hand, tells Orihime that protecting her is the reason to why he's doing this. Ichigo does deny this battle lust to Ichigo at first, but later tells him that he was right, and that he came there both because he wanted to do battle and wanting of to protect. That he does love fighting, and that he came to Heiko Mundo to defeat Grimjow. That adrenaline of battle. He's always been the fighter type. He is the meaning of he who protects. And he's learned from fighting people like Kimpachi, his inner hollow, and Grimjow that the frenzy of battle is a glorious thing. Even if he pretends to act disinterested, he is about protecting his friends. And how does one do that? Battle. Something that the Kimpachi within his subconscious said he seeks. It makes him feel alive. He mastered his holification during his fight with Grimjow. He has embraced the love for battle. This is why he was able to keep going for so long. He had accepted himself and following that himself and Hollow Ichigo. That being which consumed Ichigo during the fight with Okiura was that of being a pure instinct. In this battle, his fears become true as we spoke about. He loses control entirely and awakens to the notion, as we said, that he has killed and mutilated an enemy not to mention wounding one of his friends. Even though Ichigo had mastered his holification, he has still got his sanity. Just look back at what Shinji said. The idea of going completely insane is what kept Ichigo held back for a long time. That very fear that he thought he had controlled by defeating fear itself was actually overtaken by Okiura's vision of instinct, forced out by pure manifestation of battle. The trauma from the Orkira fight and the fear of his hollow power again strikes his resolve as he continues to fight on. Hence, this is why he couldn't hold his mask for very long against Yami. He's not the same as he was before. This again goes back to mind and body. Ichigo was again brought upon the idea of fear and was shaken. Then, in the face of an overwhelmingly powerful Aizen that seemed unbeatable, and he was mentioned earlier, literally was told to him his whole life was a lie, it messed with him mentally. Eventually, it all gets to him. His dad snaps him out of it, and the rain in his inner world stops, even though at this point it's pretty flooded. Tenzuzangetsu calls his hollow from his roots of despair. Bleach has a ton of references to Nietzschean philosophy. There is a famous quote by Nietzsche, Whoever fights monsters should see to it that in the process he does not become a monster. And if you gaze long enough into the abyss, the abyss will gaze back at you. This scene symbolizes that very quote. His inner hollow form resembles himself and the two are face to face gazing at each other from underwater, being the abyss. Because his despair has sunken his world to the bottom of the ocean. The battle with Byakuya was the fight for mastering reason. The battle with Okiura was the fight for mastering instinct. I suppose this is why people compare Byakuya and Okiura, naturally for the wrong reason of course, but they were enemies that trolled Ichigo's character mentally and physically. The battle with Aizen, he must now master balancing both together, and be one with his reason and instinct, because Aizen signifies the abandonment of these two things. He tried to rise above and become a whole new being. His, quote unquote, to the edge of reason scene was a great representation of this. You see, Ichigo was at the state to fight Aizen, 
spiritual energy wise and physically. The only thing holding him back was mentality. This was stated with Unahana when healing him on their way to fight Karakura, seeing how little he had and still matching that of captain level. Not to mention Ishin was unable to sense Aizen while fighting, as if he was fighting something that was non-existent. Then Ichigo comes along and says that it's impossible because he sensed his energy was too high to beat. Ichigo being able to see him implied Ichigo was on the same dimension as Aizen. So, after three months of training in the Dongai, came to realize his acceptance to Zongetsu for once and for all, reading loneliness in his sword and himself. With the power he has, and with him attaining this mentality of inner calmness and resolve, he becomes powerful enough to do battle with Aizen and with strong confidence. Notice that before using the Mugetsu technique, he had come to terms with everything, to the point that rather than worrying about himself, he went out of his way to prolong the fight so he could even read Aizen's emotions and understand the enemy, while at the same time hitting with every intent to kill. For Ichigo, he had to embrace both instinct and reason and not allow either to completely overcome the other. You need something to drive you forward, but you must also embrace your humanity and the balancing of himself and his powers that come back within the final arc. So, the Thousand Year Blood War arc, the arc that molds all of these ideals, morals and development and wraps it all up. It is here where Ichigo learns all of his origins and true nature. In order to take the next step, he must now learn the true nature of his Zanpakuto and the true nature of himself and his power to move ahead. There was always a mystery about who Ichigo really was and how his powers worked, and the reveal was only building up throughout the manga. Ishin's backstory of course would reveal a lot of things, not to mention his relationship with Misaki but also with Ryukin as well. Ryukin and Misaki would also play a part in Ishin's backstory. Basically, it's where we find out that Ishigo is a Quincy. Lol, spoiler, I know some of you didn't read past the anime, so that's your fault. Ichigo was told by Zangetsu that he had natural Shinigami power dominant inside of him as well very early on in the series. It is later revealed that he inherited his Shinigami power from his father. I could go on about everything but the rain arc but you should go read it. It was pretty straightforward on which where his heritages came from. During this arc he got to learn about accepting Zangetsu and Mini Yuha for what he was. Uh, he also chose the path of a soul reaper and chose to accept both and that's how he managed to balance both of them. There was also no swaying towards one or the other. If you remember, Ichigo always used to sway towards your watch more than Hollow Ichigo because he feared him. Now, he had essentially become harmonious with both. This, in fact, is the climax of Ichigo growing as a person. He now knows who he is and what he's gonna do. Squad Zero notice he has without a doubt changed and has grown as a person to which Ichibei solidifies this, but also corrects that it's not just strength, but mind and body. We got to see Ichigo's growth as a person and how he overcame his internal struggles, becoming more mature and gaining greater peace of mind. He'd be a great role model for teenagers, which is fitting for shonen manga, you'd think. But maybe that's why Ichigo was different from his shonen counterparts. He's too real maybe. I guess people who read shonen, especially for the demographic, want to escape that sense of realism. That's why maybe Luffy, Naruto and Goku work better. Either way, that doesn't mean there's anything wrong in how Ichigo is written. So all that's left in the Thousand Year Blood War arc is for Ichigo to defeat Yuwach to avenge his mother. The poem for volume 1 of the series is, we fear that which cannot be seen. That which cannot be seen is death. It is fear of the unknown. It's possibly the most primal fear of man. This is shown by the fact that initially Hollows and Shinigami were invisible because we cannot see death and what lies beyond. Of course, for Ichigo, his fear of death is linked to his fear of failure. For him, death means that he has failed to protect another person which was brought heavily by the death of his mother. Thanks to Rukia, he slowly but surely overcame this, which is, from a story perspective, was shown through him becoming more familiar with the Soul Society and eventually leading on to Kazui. Kazui meaning courage. There are many examples throughout the series that show these themes. So let me give you a brief theme of each arc. The theme of the Substitute Shinigami arc is sudden death and grief. This is shown how pluses become hollows, how Ichigo and his family dealt with the loss of his mother, the death of Orihime's brother Sora and what he went through as a ghost, and Uryu's loss of grandfather. The Soul Society arc's theme, death you know will come and trying to prevent slash accept it. Ichigo's journey throughout the Soul Society trying to prevent Ruki's execution, and with her accepting her fate. This is shown best by the scene of chapter 150. The Aranka arc, 
how your heart stays with your loved ones after you die. This is shown through Rukia's thoughts and memories of Kayan during the battle with Adinero. We also explore the Espada, each representing an aspect of death, loneliness, age, sacrifice, etc. In the Decide chapters, the fear of death was what made Aizen evolve and reach godhood. In the end, both Ichigo and Aizen have a metaphorical death, losing their power for pursuing their goals in life. And then the Fallbring arc being the Lost Agent arc, being the theme of coping with loss. Ichigo is now coping with the loss of his power, and execution try extorting his grief. Tsukushima also learnt to cope with the loss of Ginjo moments before his death. The Thousand Year Blood War arc, the theme of progression. Rukia is the death in the death in the strawberry, and Asnot was a representation of fear. Rukia was confronted with fear, and Asnot was confronted with death. The main villain itself is a literal representation of we fear that of which cannot be seen. You watch could see everything and wanted to create a world without fear. He failed because without fear there is no courage, which means there is no progress. You watch his speech from chapter 677 and the sketches of the final volume is a nice callback to chapter 0 side A the sand. Because from side A the sand, which is Ichigo, quotes this. If destiny is made of gears, and we are the sand in between that is torn apart, there is nothing left to do but be powerlessness. If I cannot protect by just extending my hand, then give me a strong blade and enough strength to shatter fate. From side B, Rukia. It is rotating. If destiny is like a cogwheel, we are the reason to why it spins. We step forward believing we are right towards the matching powers. Ichigo learned to overcome his fears. He even said, the future can be changed and I won't give in to despair. But this is different. You watch, however, represents the belief that all events are predetermined and therefore inevitable. With this knowledge and with a fallen comrade and a broken blade, Ichigo knows full well that whatever he tries, it just won't work. This is the story's way of having there be a high level of tension in the climactic finale. He then, of course, gets his fighting power back. Everything here and from then is on a nice callback to side A's chapter of the sand. Let's be honest, without Orihime and Tsukushima, there is no way to defeat someone who can transform the future. And Ichigo was completely completely in the right to give up. It wasn't that he had regressed, it was the pure fact that he was being a realist at this point. So when there is a silver of opportunity, hope was brought back by Orihime and Tsukushima. Imagine this, your watch is a dungeon master who can alter how the story goes or retcon the past. Every change creates a new save game and that save game is automatically loaded. Even though Ichigo, the player, doesn't want to load it, his game is now loaded with a broken blade. Orihime can basically load a previous save game. Game. However, there isn't a save game to use where the blade isn't broken. You watch deleted those because he's basically a dick, and Tsukushima is the game cheater. He basically takes you watch his save game, uses a cheat engine to change the stats of the blade from broken to unbroken, and creates a new save game to which the date is slightly before the real save game, allowing Orihime to load said save game in the best terminology that somebody came up with. I think delving into poetry would be better for another video because I could make a video for hours, but I like Renji's in volume 73. Fire dripping from my fangs does not disappear but keeps the battlefield burning, bringing the true face of a friend to light. It's a great addition to add him giving encouragement when lifting Ichigo from the ground. What Ichigo had was purpose. A goal is something that you have to achieve. Goals always move in a forward direction. You can track your progress against a goal, like Ichigo avenging his mother for example, but purpose has no directionality. You can't go forward in your purpose or backwards on your purpose. A purpose is the reason to why you act the way you do. It's a justification or a reasoning that motivates you in a certain way. Which leads off to my final point. Purposes equate goals. Yusuke is a spirit detective who works on a case-by-case -case basis and so he doesn't really need any overarching goals to sort of organise his actions in the storyline. What matters is what all of it will actually mean in the overarching story and the journey that the story has. Ichigo's purpose is to protect his friends and by doing so leads him down a path. It's all about the cause effect of the world around him, the effects caused by the actions he takes to save his friends. Like in the Arankar arc, 
the Gote 13 who basically a society decided that Orihime isn't worth saving and has ultimately defected and betrayed them. So Ichigo saves his friend without their help. Obstacles make themselves apparent and he overcomes them. It works for the characters in One Piece and Naruto too. Everything that happens in One Piece is caused by attempting to become the Pirate King and other such things. The end goal is simple. The journey is the interesting part. Though even though I feel having a purpose is 98% of the story here, I think there was a goal outshined by this. Which isn't a bad thing because the purpose is what is more important. But the end of the goal was finding out about his mother and avenging her so he can close that traumatic experience and guilt that he had always had. So I think I'll finish it there. I hope you enjoyed, this was very interesting, there was other things that I would have loved to have mentioned like the light novels and how after the full bring which was rushed, the death save the strawberry light novel is a nice little bit of extra info that delved in just before the full bring arc and how it talks about what Ichigo did when he lost his powers, the 17 months he never stopped ever trying to save and protect people, it was a somber read but you know translations, so I didn't include them and there's a lot of philosophy and Buddhist reference. But to end it off, I just want to give a fantastically huge shout out to Soul Madness and his new channel Soul, if you can please go check that out, for his hard work on making this look as presentable as possible. So please check out his channel and his latest Bleach video that he did, along with Clyde's which are in the description down below. Also, shout out to Clyde and Audrey for proofreading uh, and making sure I didn't mess anything up. Also, Audrey does great art too, so go commission her if you want some amazing art for anything on your day today needs and also thank you guys for being so damn patient do you like these type of videos please let me know and share this around and i'll frequently make more quality content like this also if you would like to take your time to hit up my patreon there is rewards which includes weekly talks with me on discord or you could do a one-off donation on my paypal and we can talk about if you want a reward that way it'd be really interesting to get your guys's ideas and thoughts on progression in the future and right before we end the video i do want to say we do now have some merch of course there is going to be a link in the description if you want to go check out the designs that we have go check it out they're really awesome and hopefully if these do really well we can really get involved in some more stuff such as caps mugs you name it have a peek tell me what you think and if you have any designs you think will be cool of course hit me up on twitter i'm calling this the season one of merchandise let's try and make a season two but i am gonna leave it off with that i'm gonna catch you motherfuckers later you guys of course have this fine day being handsome and as always people peace out <laughs>